I am uh, Dr. William Chung, the Managing Editor of uh, Fulcrum, which is the commentary and analysis website published by the IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute here in Singapore. Very glad to have here with me today uh, two friends, uh, Dr. Jayant Menon, a senior fellow from ICES and formerly a, a senior ec economist with the Asia Development Bank, and uh, Dr. Sopal Ear, the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs and Global Development at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. Um, Sopal lectures on global political economy, international organizations, and regional management in Asia. And uh, many people will know that Sopal wrote and narrated the award-winning documentary film, The End and Beginning, Cambodia, based on his 2009 TED Talk and has appeared in five other documentaries. A graduate of Princeton and, and Berkeley, he moved to the US from France as a Cambodian refugee at the age of 10. And there's a, there's a, a lot of stories behind that, which our listeners should, should uh, be keen on uh, watching and reading. Um, given the, the relative uh, confines of the, this podcast in terms of the timing, we're going to confine the discussions to developments in Cambodia and the transition in Cambodia and not tap on the other topics that uh, Sopal is an expert on. But so we're going to just talk about transition in Cambodia. And of course, as we can see in, in, in the recent changes in, in Cambodia, primarily on the political front, we are seeing Cambodia coming into a lot of high profile in the region. We also see Cambodia's growing economic growth, its economic weight, and of course, its very successful chairing of ASEAN in uh, last year, when when it uh, pulled out quite a number of initiatives. And of course, we've uh, we've seen recently the very historic political transition, where very long-serving Hun Sen, the Prime Minister, handed power to his son Hun Mene. Um, so. Uh, Without much uh, further ado, I'd um, like to uh, start the podcast by asking uh, Sopal. Uh, Sopal, we have seen the historic political transition uh, in Cambodia recently from Hun Sen to his son Hun Mene. What are your views of this uh, uh, transi uh, transition, um, especially uh, so recently after the elections in the country? All right. Well, thank you, first of all, um, William, for, for inviting and, and Jay for joining and <clears throat> making this possible. I, I, I think it's a historic moment for, uh, for Cambodia. 38 years of uh, the same prime minister, uh, Hun Sen, uh, finally changing, uh, handing off to, uh, to a new prime minister, I think is, is, can't be denied as at least change of some kind that, that is that people have been waiting for for a while to see what's happening next, right? It's been long running speculation about the selection and uh, of of the successor, and um, it's finally happened, which I think means new blood, new ideas, potentially, uh, possibly reforms, and and a new outlook that uh, that I you know Cambodians hope for, uh, as well as I would say all of all of the uh, the partners for Cambodia would like to kind of encourage in terms of changes in in the in the politics, the policies of the country, especially politically. Uh, and William, you're absolutely right that the economy has <laughs> grown so much in the last uh, couple of decades, and it's it's very impressive. Um, that is one of the one of one of the points of pride for the uh, exiting prime minister. Uh, to hand off an economy that it has developed as much as it has to his son. Um, obviously, you know, one can't tell yet where the direction is going to be. He's made some speeches, and Manet has made some speeches uh, calling for uh, more competence, um, more, um, uh, le less, uh, you know, less corruption <laughs> in some ways. Uh, and that's obviously good uh, because the direction of the country in terms of um, its rankings on the corruption perception index hasn't been good, so uh, we need we need to turn that ship around. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think there's there's uh, generally optimism about the future now, but 
we need to see what the actions are. Words aren't enough, right? You can say what, whatever you want. You need to see the actions follow through on uh, on changes in in how the government is run. Mm-hmm. And how how you you mentioned uh, the the fact that Hun Mane is now in power and with the prospect of some political reform. And of course, is when when we look at Hun Mane, uh, kind of his background. Um, you know, he he graduated from West Point. Um, and he has a he has PhD, I think, from a a, a British uh, university. He seems that it's, it's ticking the boxes of somebody who should be, you know, uh, somewhat cosmopolitan and somewhat open to to some kind of liberal inclinations that he could have picked up from the West. But uh, but that's yeah. in the first cut. But I I, I do wonder. Under whom many would would you think that there might be even some chance or possibility of reforms on the political front? I mean, one has to believe or hope for that. I I've known him mm-hmm. since his West Point days. Um, was uh, honored to have him at my wedding and to join his wedding. Uh, I think that on a personal level, he has always sounded very reasonable. Uh, n- not certainly in the times I've known him, he never behaved in any way that that suggested uh, uh, a uh, dictatorial streak or any kind of authoritarian tendencies. But obviously, there's a reason why he was handed the keys to the prime ministership, because he is to continue the legacy of, of the Hun family. He is to continue um, that uh, dynasty. Um, Hun Sen has said, or prior to handing off, he said that he would be the father of the prime minister and the grandfather of the prime minister in in the 2030s so he's he already suggesting that he that his grandchild will become prime minister after after uh hun Manet, uh finishes so um but you know he he's he's prone to hyperbole as well so he always says things like you know in the past he said that he would run cambodia until his 90s um obviously that isn't true but in point of fact, he is still in the background even now. I mean, uh, while he has not yet been elected formally to the Senate, it's understood that once he is come next year, he will then assume the presidency of the Senate. He's already assumed the presidency of the um, of of the King's Privy Council, and and uh, and you know by virtue of that alone, and his heading the Cambodian People's Party, the ruling party, he gets to choose more or less who is part of the party and who isn't, and therefore could decide that, you know, his son might not merit continuing as prime minister and could return as prime minister. He hasn't said it that way. He said, if some if some danger were to take place uh, towards uh, Hun Manet, his son, he would come back as prime minister. So um, he's warning people, don't try anything. If you do, I'll, I'll take back the prime ministership. Mm. Um, I'm trying to be a bit cheeky here, but I, I think it's kind of uh, what Lee Kuan Yew said uh, when he was still alive, uh, that, you know, in the future when I'm gone and in my grave and, if, you know, there are anything that happens in Singapore, I will come out from my grave and, you know, try to rearrange things. I, I mean, obviously he meant it half jesting, but I think you get the gist of what he's trying I to say. I show the video to uh, my yeah. students. That precise video, <laughs> I, I show. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, uh, Hun Sen is primarily trying to do the same thing. I mean, he's going to go and he he's, won't be prime minister, but he, he will be around and uh, he will have his say in, in, in what's happening. Um, Jay, do, do, do you have a comment or question? Yeah, uh, let me just pick up on that theme. Um, uh, Safal, you mentioned um, New Blood earlier on. Um, I guess we are still talking about how new uh, it's going to be, uh, this change uh, or transition. Uh, But certainly there's going to be a lot more blood around. There's been an expansion in the government apparatus. We've seen a huge increase um, in the size of uh, the administration. And a lot of that seems to be... uh, dynastic as you put it uh, you know multiple dynasties uh, uh, not just the prime ministership being uh, handed down but also 
uh, you know, in various different ministries. Uh, the new uh, Minister of Commerce is the daughter of a former Minister of Commerce. And this is uh, not necessarily good or bad, but there, it does happen with great frequency and regularity across uh, various portfolios and all across uh, government. Do you see this type of almost incestuous nature of um, political uh, transformation or lack thereof as being a problem? Um, so we can't just talk about the prime ministership being handed down from father to son, but it does appear to be more widespread. And what does that mean in the context of a huge increase in the size of government? What, or how do you read? Yeah, that? it's 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 certainly concerning, Jay. I, I think that the the fact is, uh, if they're being paid, this is this is a wage bill that uh, a country the size of Cambodia should not have to bear. But not just that, of course. It it also means that that uh, a lot more bureaucracy, political in nature, will have to be penetrated in order to reach uh, the real decision makers. We, un we know that the reason why this was done was to stabilize, um, was, to, was to make a deal that would allow the arrangement that, that uh, resulted in, in Manet being prime minister to continue forward. Other parents who are senior ministers who hold you know, important ministries would have questioned why their child should not take that role or should not compete fairly for that role. And um, instead, they're being placated with a what I call primogen political primogenitor, uh, the oldest taking on essentially the inheritance of the parent. Um, you know, National Bank of Cambodia governor handing off to his daughter, who had already been, albeit the deputy governor. And so, you know, of of all the the, the, the politicians coming up, uh, she's had a good reputation for innovation, bringing digital currencies and. And even cryptocurrency. So, I think I think that um, in some cases it's it's heartwarming, and, and uh, in others, I think I think that there's going to be questions about, you know, what qualifies the individual. And of course, it means inevitably that those who aren't born to the right families don't get the chance then to uh, to lead a ministry, even never mind the country, you know, to lead a ministry because because the the position appears to be inherited, uh, just as uh, generalships in Cambodia appear to the stars appear to be inherited in many instances. Um, that's that goes contrary, obviously, to, to valuing yes. competence and and all the things that that bureaucracy should be should be about, right? But um, but yeah, the large wage bill uh, is concerning the uh, the the stability created from that, but also the instability possibly generated because. Because uh, after all, if uh, if if a ministry is the purview of a family, does it mean that the prime minister can remove them from uh, remove that that minister from 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 power? Um, and so it, it's very problematic to say the least. Can I just mm -hmm. uh, pick up on that, uh, William? Uh, uh, so, so well, I guess you mentioned. Uh, how uh, there appears to be this concentration of uh, power through this expansion in family, familial links in government. I wonder how much of that uh, extends beyond government. And this is where, you know, uh, we, we can see Cambodia has done remarkably well uh, in terms of the data on the economic indicators, uh, Economic growth has been spectacularly high, above 7.5% on average leading up to the pandemic. How much is that uh, really reaching, uh, you know, the masses? Uh, we know the, the data on inequality is weak uh, everywhere, but it's particularly, I think, uh, problematic in Cambodia. In fact, the Gini has been falling when you only have to visit on pen to see that this has to be an aberration <laughs> of sorts. I mean, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, Bentley's parked next to Scavenger's 
uh, you know, trying to work out a daily wage, uh, daily living. Um, so very rapid economic growth, but, you know, most of Cambodia is still rural. Uh, it's remarkable how rural the country really is, uh, which you don't probably see when you visit the cities or uh, appreciate. Um, what can, um, uh, what will Hun Manet do, you think, or be able to do to try and uh, reach uh, the broader population, have growth become more inclusive, uh, or will this structure of, you know, familial links, uh, massive bureaucracy stand in the way? Um, can, can Cambodia become a more inclusive society uh, under Hun Manet? Well, that's the million billion dollar question, Jay. I think I think we all recognize that uh, that the cooking of numbers, the uh, the aberrations, as you diplomatically call them, uh, cannot be verified or cannot be ascertained uh, when ground truth uh, and uh, and when you see for your own eyes what what goes on, right? So it's there's this divergence between what we're being told and what in fact, we can observe with our own eyes uh, in terms of incredible wealth uh, being uh, being concentrated in the hands of the very few. I think you you start your question with beyond the bureaucracy, beyond the the political level, other layers. I, I, I'd have to say that there's there's certainly a sense that um, that what goes on at the top would also apply to lower layers because there's a kind of arrangement made in Cambodia in terms of patronage, in terms of who holds what power. And so that goes on and on in terms of uh, concentration of, of, of bureaucratic power. Um, the families own the ministries, those families that have uh, essentially passed on to their child the, the particulars. Uh, but uh, but there's there's I think at at, at 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 the directorship level there's also going to be a lot of this going on. There's there's going to be an arrangement to allow for people to to feel comfortable with with what goes on because they are being first of all you have six thousand uh, you know opposition members who have been integrated into the uh, ruling party. Where are they going to be? They need to be paid to continue agreeing to this. So they they they've got to be added, and then they can't all be ministers, obviously, and they're not. So they have to take other positions, right? They it all has to be added into the uh, the uh, superstructure of government. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, the hope the hope is always that sensibility would prevail, and that um, that uh, somebody would recognize that concentrating political power with extreme wealth might not be such a great idea. Obviously, uh, as the African proverb goes, fish rots from the top. So you, you've got you've got to set the example at the top in order to tell the others underneath you that this is unacceptable. Um, that would apply, for example, to you know Hunmanet's family, uh, his wife having directorships and so on. Is that compatible with the husband uh, being prime minister, as well as across ministries where? You know, various ministers have their spouses holding fabulously wealthy uh, positions uh, in conglomerates uh, and, and and with incredible wealth as a result. So how are conflicts of interest resolved? How uh, are interested parties not uh, somehow uh, allowed to uh, make decisions or to know information that would be conflictual in nature? Um, these are these are all considerations. I, since we talked about Lee Kuan Yew uh, uh, earlier with William, I'll, I'll mention that I'm fond of also telling my students that, you know, when he started the first government, he came out with with uh, white shirts to symbolize the the lack of corruption or the clean government that he intended for Singapore. We need to have something symbolic at the very least of that nature, but more than symbolic, some something real by way of saying that, you know, uh, there ought to be real disclosure of assets. There ought to be transparency. There, are, there can't we can't tolerate any kind of situation where government officials and their families are accruing that kind of wealth. But that's very difficult in a country like Cambodia that is so used to 
you know, declaration of assets that are in sealed envelopes that won't be opened unless somebody suspects something in the ruling party. That just basically means own whatever you want. Just put it in this envelope, seal it, and don't share it with anybody, which is obviously useless when there's no disclosure. Wow, that's that's really interesting, the sealed envelopes. Um, talking about Lee you and the white shirts uh, so far, do you see any indication, you said that you've, you've met, you've interacted with Kun Mane uh, before, do you see any indication uh, from him at least, from the leader himself, that he intends to instill some kind of, what for want of a better term, some kind of white shirt kind of system in government in terms of cleaning up corruption and, and all that? So one of the first speeches I've heard uh, televised uh, was admonishing advisors who are also tycoons or who hold uh, uh, corporate uh, interest assets. Uh, he's trying to, t to signal that if you are a tycoon, uh, what's known in Khmer as Anoknya, you can also be a, an advisor or an excellency, which is the more of the political end of things. Uh, that that's I think something that's that's important. I was you know obviously it's good if, if he says that, and he means it, and there are actual consequences for people who are doing that. Then that's great. I will also note that the list of advisors he's assuming is exactly his father's list of advisors. So uh, nobody is being moved from anywhere. He's not. He may be obtaining his own list of advisors, but in addition to them is an entire list of one hundred and fifty advisors that his father is passing on to him uh, because after all, they were attached to the prime ministership and therefore they continue on. But, you know, signaling that you are willing to break away to think uh, new thoughts or diverge from the path that your father has set is important. But at the same time, we know he needs to consolidate power. He hasn't, he obtained the position through his father that makes already everyone look at him with less than, hey, he, he had the medal to win an election, right? No, it's his father won the election and then said, I resign, here's the position. That makes it difficult for others to swallow and perhaps accept. And so the, the expectation is that consolidation of power will be taking place, meaning what exactly? I mean, it could be showing off some of the strength he has in order to scare away anyone who would dare oppose him. Mm. Um, we haven't yet seen much of that, and maybe it won't be necessary for a while, but in any situation where you're trying to assert yourself, unfortunately, that's what is bound to happen at some point if you want to really prove that you've got that medal uh, to, mm. uh, to, to, to fight off opponents. Mm. Thanks for that. Um, Jay, I think that you have a question about China? Yeah. Yes, I think we can uh, shift gears a little bit, uh, although it's still broadly in terms of, you know, how much change can we expect following this political transition? And, uh, you know, Cambodia is sometimes referred to as a client state of China. I personally think that's a bit of an unfair uh, label. Um, uh, Cambodia has strong relations with China, but I uh, I wonder if you could uh, share your thoughts on how you see that relationship evolving under uh, uh, Prime Minister Hun Manet um, and uh, in the context of, you know, uh, early signs that Cambodia might be looking to diversify uh, its uh, relations um, uh, to keep, um, you know, uh, the dependency uh, in check, so to speak. Uh, I think we've seen some of that, uh, especially with uh, Japan and Korea, uh, with aid and other uh, trade and investment relations. How do you see that evolving under Hun Manet? That's, Jay, that's a great question. I, I think that, that generally the official line of the authorities has always been that they're open to all and any and all relations, including with the United States. They're not against anybody. They want to be friends with everyone and so on and so forth. But of course, 
even if the label of client state is unfair, there there's certainly been a signaling over the last decade that suggests that it's an important relationship that is uh, unequaled, unparalleled in its importance to to others, right? So uh, when Hun Sen built the, uh, had the uh, Victory Monument, the Win-Win Monument built, uh, the Win-Win, is, he always talks about Win-Win, and the, the relief on the wall in the Angkorian style of a bas relief included a scene where, you know, Xi Jinping meets for the first time Hun Manet in the presence of Hun Sen as he's introducing his son, right? Um, mm-hmm. There's also, of course, the understanding that Beijing has, has fully supported, is fully supporting this transition and will be uh, giving Hun Manet the platform to meet at a level commensurate with his, with his position uh, with the leaders in China, probably with Xi Jinping. But, you know, that that, that 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 is an important signal of Cambodia's uh, importance to China. Uh, and notwithstanding even the idea that it's speculated upon, but I think there's probably truth in this, that um, that uh, they've uh, even given a plane to Hun Sen to use in the event of emergency where he can simply, uh, you know, go off if there should be a need to, the Chinese have. So, so that, that is, that is, a, a, an action that suggests how important Hun Sen is, what an investment his family represents to China. Uh, of course, there's a need to show diversity in terms of your, and it, it would behoove any leader to go beyond the, uh, the, 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 the eggs in the same basket. You've got, you've got to diversify, you've got to put them in different baskets in case they fall and break. And I think that with, um, with, uh, with Korea and with Japan, that's always been the case that, you know, Cambodia does not reject their intervention, their, their aid, their uh, assistance, their investments. Uh, Japan and Korea are not going to get in the faces of Cambodia about democracy, human rights, those kinds of things. Uh, they might say something about, and especially in the case of Japan, about the naval base, real naval base, but we'll get to that later. Um, so there's, there's a sense that, that, you know, can we turn the page? And with UNGA, uh, there is certainly the hope, and I know that there are plans already afoot to have Hun Manet in front of a series of American CEOs where he can present in his excellent English and show that a new face to Cambodia and perhaps reset that relationship on a business level. I don't know if it'll be reset on a on a diplomatic level in terms of um, suddenly, you know, the United States would embrace Hun Manet. They would like to believe that Hun Manet is different. They would like to believe that there, there's hope that, that that change will happen with him. And if there is, all the better for everyone, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. So far, I think uh, you're absolutely right in terms of... Uh, Cambodia keeping its options open. I mean, client state or no, whether you agree with that statement. I've spoken to uh, advisors to the Cambodian government which says exactly what you're saying. In fact, um, in our state of Southeast Asia survey, uh, which is, is a survey of uh, sentiment by Southeast Asian kind of academics, officials, uh, media I've answered persons, it multiple NGOs. years. Yeah. Oh, thank, thanks for that. Thanks thank for your you. Support. I, I yeah. think that one of the sentiment expressed among Cambodians is the, the positive sentiment that they have towards Japan. And of course, those that have been around long enough know the kind of support and assistance that the country of Japan has actually given uh, to Cambodia. China does definitely hawks a lot of the news headlines uh, in, in Cambodia, but Japan has been quite dependable in terms of support FDI, especially in economic uh, development. So I, I absolutely agree with you that it's it's astute policy to keep your your options open uh, when, when it comes to uh, even countries like Japan and the United States that are kind of outside uh, the, the Sinosphere. In fact, I, w- I would put it to you that, you know, when um, Cambodia assumed the, the chair of ASEAN in 2022, um, that there was some kind of, should we say, some trepidation among uh, uh, 
think tankers and analysts because they remembered what happened the last time that Cambodia was the chair of ASEAN, and that was 2012. And that was when ASEAN was trying to cobble together a statement on the South China Sea. And um, uh, that communique failed. And it was the first time in ASEAN's then, if I remember correctly, 45-year history that ASEAN failed to issue an official communique uh, in 2012. And people were going, what, what happened to that? Cambodia's chairmanship of ASEAN in 2012. But, you know, in, in 2022, I think um, my colleagues will agree with me. I'm sure Jay will agree with me that Cambodia did a respectable, creditable job as chair of ASEAN. Uh, it, it, it led an initiative to the Myanmar. Uh, not, not that effective, but it was, a, it was an idea to open up a channel with the generals in, in Myanmar. It uh, opposed uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine at, at the United States General Assembly and it's actually, you know, dispatch uh, uh, demining teams uh, to Ukraine to help the Ukrainians with clearing some of their minds. So I think, you know, um, it's kind of hard to read for somebody who's sitting outside Cambodia, but it looks like these are kind of like correct steps to take if you want to be kind of a responsible player country in ASEAN and in, in the regional community wanting to play a positive role. So I think in a sense, not I, I agree with Jay. I, I think perhaps that client state of China label is a bit unfair. Uh, uh, yeah. Sure. No, and, yeah. I, and I, I I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And and I would add that, you know, the, the hiccup with the Myanmar situation, it was perceived as Cambodia going off the reservation, doing its uh -huh. own thing for a bit. But then after he basically got the message that you know, we don't appreciate this. Everything was smooth after that. He basically said, okay, fine. I'm not going to try this uh, cowboy diplomacy uh, activity. And uh, I'll, 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 things were calm. And there were no I instances of communiques that didn't come out after meetings or, you know, spokespersons saying that um, uh, they would the ASEAN would not international would would now not it would not internationalize the South China Sea, which of course was not true, and caused and caused all kinds of uh, uh, kerfuffle with the Philippines. So, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Jay, you wanted to say something. I'm I'm sorry if I interrupted you. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, I was just going to say that I think uh, well, it's two things. One is that you know I think we shouldn't forget how far. Cambodia has come, right, given yeah. its tragic history. And I think this, uh, this is part of uh, the point that William was trying to make, that, you know, uh, you know, when you start, as you know better than any of us uh, so far, when you start, when your initial conditions are almost ground zero, uh, not that long ago, uh, Cambodia, I think, is, I often say this, is Asia's true miracle economy. Right, uh, and we yeah. should recognize that and uh, celebrate that. Uh, of course, this is not to say that you know we expect uh, improvements. We expect a lot uh, uh, from uh, this country, um, and you know donors also expect a lot. Uh, but sometimes I think they forget how far uh, uh, Cambodia has come and how much has been achieved, and how many other countries in this region uh, without that historical baggage to carry are start struggling with similar problems, right? From the most advanced, dare I say, to uh, countries at similar levels of development. Um, I'm currently in Manila and here the dynastic uh, problem in government is perhaps, uh, you know, uh, benchmarks uh, setting, right? I mean, it's everywhere right down to uh, you know, uh, what they call barangay or village level uh, elections where the hereditary transfer of power is, you know, uh, so commonplace that it's actually reported upon when it's not happened, right? When there's been a change in hereditary transfer uh, through, you know, uh, elections, it's reported as something uh, special and uh, almost unique uh, and so, so this, this is something I think we should note. But 
China is also uh, important for uh, economic relations, but uh, the burgeoning relationship with Japan and Korea economically is helping more in diversifying Cambodia's economic structure, right? Uh, Chinese investments are still more traditional, mostly to the BRI and infrastructure. But, uh, uh, you know, if Cambodia wants to diversify as it uh, states in all of its strategic development plans, then it's not coming so far from China, but uh, through the global supply chain related investments from Japan and now Korea and Taiwan. So, um, uh, you know, what do you think so far about Hun Manet's economic credentials compared to uh, his father? I mean, he has more academic qualifications in that respect. Do you think there'll be a change in economic policy? I know economics is not your main area, but of course it cuts across yeah. more and more these days. Uh, so there's a geopolitical element, but uh, how do you think he will manage uh, the geopolitics uh, and the economics uh, in this region? Uh, within ASEAN and beyond with China and Japan and Korea? No, absolutely. I, look, I think, I think Manet's um, credentials are, are stellar, really. They're, they're uh, ideal for somebody in that position, in his position. Uh, I, as, I, as we talked about, a, a bachelor's in, uh, from West Point, uh, U.S. Military Academy, a, a master of arts in economics from New York University. I remember helping him or reading his uh, his master's thesis which was on 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 land um, uh, in Cambodia and then a PhD in economics uh, using econometrics uh, uh, from the University of Bristol um, so look I way better than his father's Hanoi diploma uh, and certainly far more credible than uh, than anybody else that, that worked um, you know under the say you know, all these Khmer Rouge PhD in economics from from France, who <laughs> basically ruined Cambodia with the with Marxist ideas and and uh, world systems theories and and so on of uh, exploitation. So we know that that's not going to be the approach, and that hasn't been the approach of, of the ruling party in any case. But but that you know that perhaps uh, economic competition, uh, the driving force that 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 lowers prices that creates uh, more consumer surplus that's what we all hope can happen in cambodia in terms of policies that would lessen uh, monopoly lessen uh, uh, producer surplus and increase the the ability of of of, of cambodians to enjoy uh, lower prices um, so uh, opening cambodia to more international trade um, making cambodia more competitive uh, positioning Cambodia in a more export-oriented fashion that, that it already is. I mean, obviously, it exports to the, to the United States to the extent that I believe it, it is it, it's the next five countries that uh, Cambodia exports to combine. That's what the U.S. export picture looks like. And, and of course, to say that, you know, China is coming up fast, of course, it's coming up as a, as a, as a, as, as a source for, for Cambodian exports, but it's, it's always been the uh, largest source of Cambodia's imports uh, yeah. because all of the stuff that Cambodia makes comes from China to assemble, to cut, to trim, to put together bicycles, for example. These are all Chinese-made bicycles that, that get the Made in Cambodia label after they've been assembled in Cambodia. So, so I'm hoping that uh, that, that training, uh, that, that state-of-the-art training he received uh, comes to good use. Uh, we we had uh, you know the, the, our our king Prince Sihanouk for a long time before he became king again was fond uh, in a book uh, by Milton Osborne. He says that the that Narodam Sihanouk would say that he he hadn't read any textbooks, but he knew how to run an economy and so on. So you know we I think we've turned the corner uh, uh, in terms of no longer having to say things like that and actually consult and knowing your economic theory at least so that you can make the the sensible policies now you know the deals that have to happen the patronage the the 
the, the arrangements, economically speaking, are so difficult in Cambodia to to extricate oneself from that. That's that's the worry, right? I mean, people are so used to making obscene profits from the relationships they have that it might be too difficult to then say you've actually got to compete now. You can't just have only rent seeking behavior in Cambodia. I think just on that point, I think one uh, uh, perhaps you can comment on this. Uh, I think we also see that a lot of the familial relations uh, in the ministries and the bureaucracy is also a function of how uh, you know these uh, the the upper echelons have been the better educated ones, the ones that have had you know access to uh, higher education overseas. Um, of course, there are exceptions, but broadly speaking, a lot of those uh, apparently hereditary transfer of uh, power is correlated with people who are highly qualified as well. But that's a function of the structure of, uh, you know, inequality in Cambodia, in a sense, where these are the people that are the best uh, qualified uh, through their higher incomes and capacity to access, um, you know, uh, education and training. And so, uh, you know, th this is all intertwined, I guess. Uh, whether this is this needs to change, well, I guess it's a question of uh, how much meritocracy can uh, be brought in to a given structure. Um, and I don't know uh, what uh, you think can uh, be done to try and marry these two uh, things of trying to make, you know, it's like uh, trying to make state-owned enterprises more market responsive in a sense, right? You yes. you inherit these things and then you say, hang on, we can't do anything about it. We can't get rid of them. Uh, we're stuck with them. But how do we get them to behave in a way as if they're not what they intrinsically are, which is, you know, uh, a product of the system. So how do you think we can make uh, make the current system more responsive to uh, merit meritocratic uh, principles without a revolution, so to speak? Right. Well, you know, I think introducing at the very least internal competition, you know, I think that was that was what the Communist Party in China would always point to, that even though there was not you know, competitive elections allowing all kinds of parties to join and 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 a free and fair process that a the internal uh, HR engine of the Communist Party was selecting the best people for the for the positions of, of mayor of cities of ten million and so on. So the so is there could there be something like that in Cambodia? I would hope so. That it would be uh, that it would not choose only princelings but individuals who who don't come from families that have ruled Cambodia in the past or have ruled portions of, uh, or have ministries under their control and that they would, uh, you know, make selections on that basis. I, I'll tell you that when I first returned to Cambodia in 96 uh, and was at the Cambodian Institute for Cooperation and Peace, one of the fellows there was Anton Moni Roth. So at that point in time, he was an advisor to Hun Sen. He was an economic technocrat. Uh, uh, now, of course, we all know he's been Minister of Economy and Finance for many years. It means that there was a selection on that on that basis for somebody who knew what they were talking about, who could handle the responsibilities of the job. Uh, and that's that's probably the, the one of the best examples of something like that happening. It doesn't, of course, mean that there's no problem with <laughs> The ministry, but it, it 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 suggests that at that point in time there was an opening for people who had competence, who were meritocratically selected. Uh, well, sure, sure, they have to be loyal, but they knew what they were doing. They'd been dealing with the World Bank, the IMF, the ADB for many years, and so they knew how to deal with these institutions, how to satisfy these institutions, and in some ways, you know, speak the language, uh, which is critically important. Uh, can there be more of that? I hope there will be more of that. Mm -hmm. I, I know that mm -hmm. I know that that's so important because that that gives you know all young people who, for example, win you know uh, scholarships to study in Singapore at the Lee Kuan Yew School, for example, from Cambodia to 
have the hope that they can someday contribute to the development and uh, not just economic, but political development of Cambodia or Fulbrighters in the United States. We have one uh, that, uh, you know, Carol Ratanat, who ran Electricity du Cambodge, is now going to be, I believe, a minister uh, of succeeding his father-in-law in the Ministry of Mines. And, and right. so there's, there's, there's that. Uh, I knew him as well. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, we hung out in New York together and, and uh, he's a good guy. But, you know, obviously you return to Cambodia, you have to work within a system just as when in Manila, you can't drive like you do in Singapore. You've got to you've got to uh, accept the reality that the traffic will go a certain way and you've got to adjust your way of, of driving. That's the culture, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And and we all know that culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch and dinner. So let's try to change that culture. Right. Oh, that's great. Just, yeah. 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 Uh, Dr. Molly Roth was the person I worked with as an ADB consultant when I first arrived there in 97. And I remember he was with CICP, with Kao Kim Hoon. And then I became an external fellow of CIP, CICP as a result. Uh, and that's going back to 97, yeah, when things were very different. He was very junior, of course. And now mm -hmm. he's finance minister. And at one point was rumored to be the successor, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. To Prime Minister Hun Sen. Uh, in fact, that was uh, not just a rumor, it was reported widely in the press. Um, when did that change? I mean, how, suddenly it appeared that Hun Manet became the obvious uh, choice when mm. for a long time it seemed that uh, uh, Alpon Marirat was being groomed almost to take over. Yeah, you know, I, I had hoped for a uh, Go Chuck Tong solution in Cambodia. I can tell you that. I mean, that would have been that would have been the the more credible sort of succession yes. plan that would have said, I'm not above the better, the, the, the good of the nation over myself or my family. But unfortunately, he reached for what he considered to be the uh, the, 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 the the choice that 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 could not be avoided. And um I don't know. I maybe it's a matter of I, I know that that Anpon Monigraf had a, a stroke at some point. His hair turned completely white thanks to Singapore medicine. He was able to uh, really recover from that. He resumed his responsibilities, uh, which is remarkable given given the uh, the stroke really. Um, but uh, you know, maybe maybe that had something to do with the with feeling as though perhaps you know this guy is. Uh, it would be too much to go from from that position onwards to even more of a heavy burden. I don't know. Um, the decision for Mohun Manet to take over was a couple of years ago, if I recall. It was already pre-announced as a kind of like, you know, we've selected, he's the designate prime minister. And then it was a matter of making sure the, the, the ministers of interior and, and defense were not going to obstruct the path. Uh, so, you know, everybody had to accept that this was going to be a fair complete. And eventually they did because there was no other choice but to accept it. So there there you have it. And and uh, so that Go Chok Tong uh, outcome with Anton Mirat as, as prime minister did not come about, unfortunately. But that is that. Yeah. William, I think you wanted to uh, raise the issue of the naval base. And I uh, think Sopal also mentioned it earlier. Do you want to... I know we're running out of time, but you might sneak that in. Yeah, uh, so far, so I've been dying to ask this question, and I'm sure uh, the issue of the rim naval base is something that is followed very heavily, uh, closely in the United States as well in Southeast Asia. So, um, basically, I want to get your sense. Um, I've spoken to some Cambodians who actually say that, uh, look, it it really is a base, you know, that is open to all. It's not just a Chinese kind of construction is not primarily for Chinese usages, but uh, we are open to, you know, having the Japanese, having the Americans, having other navies call on the base. And so I, I just want to get your sense, uh, so Paul, on what, what, where do you think this entire issue is, is heading from your point of view? 
Well, it's it's been brewing for so long, right? So the mm. the leak to the Wall Street Journal of, of of the agreement, a draft of the agreement years ago now, seems to have positioned the United States in a way that said that uh, you know unless you prove to us that this is not a Chinese base, we will assume that it is a Chinese base. And it's gotten so interesting because uh, Khmer Times, just a private newspaper, but a mouthpiece of the authorities had a, an editorial in which um, the argument was something like, Cambodia is not obligated to prove anything to anyone about the nature of this base, right? So, so don't, don't even go there in terms of making us have to prove this or that. I, I'd say, look, I, I, the, the proof is in the pudding. The base is being constructed in a way where it's very clearly the Chinese that are doing, vir- that are doing all of the construction, the peer, is an exact copy of the one in Djibouti that the Djibouti, Chinese have. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So it, it's very it's very clearly their design. It's uh, obviously going to be of use to the Chinese, but can it be used by somebody else? In theory, of course it can. Just like, uh, you know, the TPP never formally excluded China, but created conditions that China would never accept to join. So, it, you know, Trans-Pacific Partnership, these, these are the kinds of signals people people make. And, and and the and Cambodia can go on saying that you know everybody's welcome and maybe even you know they will join they will come and do a port of call visit, but um, how would you feel if you visited a a facility that was entirely Chinese constructed and you know had Chinese personnel carrying Cambodian passports under the um, the, the 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 constraint that uh, the Cambodian constitution imposes that there should be no foreign personnel on Cambodian soil um, that is. Um, that seems to me to suggest that it is that it that it's somewhere the truth is somewhere between what what, the, what Cambodia and, and, and the United States is arguing. Obviously, we're not going to come to a resolution as to what the real nature of this base is. The Americans have concluded that it appears to be for the purposes of one country. The Cambodians maintain that it is not. Where can where can we? I I suppose we would have to observe. Who stops by that naval base for the next few years to determine what purpose it serves? But clearly, as a foothold in um, mainland Southeast Asia, China will have will have access. It built the the base. It expects to to have access, and it will have access. And it's very mm-hmm. valuable. I mean, aside from, of course, all of the um, the islands it has built up in the uh, South China Sea uh, to uh, to to be sort of stationary naval uh, uh, aircraft carriers, essentially. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's really for their ships to, uh, to, to use for refueling purposes and, and as a power mm. projection for, for, their, uh, for the PLA Navy. Mm. Thanks, thanks so far, I agree with you. I think years ago, uh, before the Chinese had their port in Djibouti, the Chinese were going, you know, our law says we're not allowed to have overseas military bases and et cetera, et cetera. And then we saw Djibouti. Uh, then the Chinese are going on the same line. We don't have foreign military bases, and then we are seeing what's happening in Rim, which you know, like you say, is still we still have to ascertain who, which navies are going to entertain. Um, but like you say, the proof, uh, is is even is in the pudding. We're going to see which are the navies that are going to have that port of call on on Rim. But um, I I'm, right. I'm very mindful of the of the time uh so far, but. I, I really want to thank you, uh, Sopal, again for taking so much of your time, especially on a on an evening in Arizona, for for you know yes. working the you know my pleasure the extra mile to be for with us friends and, is always a yeah. pleasure. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah, you're always welcome at ICs as and when you you find your way back here again. Um, and and, and Jay and I will ha- happily take you out for a drink. Um, but uh, thank you. You know, as it stands, thanks thanks again for your time, and uh, we look forward to posting this podcast on on Fulcrum. <laughs>